Okay. Okay. Thank you. That means hello, Black. Uh, just to start off, I want to make um, I want to thank Matt and Evolver for making the space uh, for uh, decolonized Calgary to come and speak with you today. Much appreciated, and thank you for all of you for coming out. Um, I came across um, that poem on YouTube where you will find Decolonized Calgary online and um, I just want to read you uh, a little bit about the maker to start. Ryan Redcorn, all such, graphic artist, owner of Red Hand Media and Democraties.com Ryan is a Osage who spent his early years on the Osage Reservation in the largest of the three existing traditional Osage, Osage Indian villages. The Wahakskolin district. He is a member of Tsisowa Shaki clan, peacemaker, gentle sky clan, and was named accordingly at age five. Since grade six, he has been a participant in the Osage in Long Shaka dance. Ryan attended the University of Kansas, where he graduated in 2003 with a BFA in graphic design. While at KU, he served four years in the First Nations Student Association, and two of those years as co-president. In 2004, he was named the Big 12 Conference Native American Leadership Graduate Student of the year. Among other things, he curated an all-Native activist art exhibit for the Mid-American Students Association, sat on several university-wide discussion panels dealing with the issues of Indian mascots and American Indian identity, helped organize a protest at the Kansas City Chiefs Washington Redskins game, and is currently working on a documentary on the Indian mascot issue. Ryan's graphic design clientele is almost exclusively Native American tribes, Native-owned businesses, and Native American nonprofit groups. He is very familiar with protocol and the proper use of imagery of Native American populations and producing work on a national level through the integration of tribally specific designs to each one of the respective communities. Ryan bridges the long-standing gap between traditional Native communities and the graphic design world that is used to represent them to the general public. He has earned the trust and respect of Indigenous communities throughout the country with his, with his hands-on communal level approach and understanding of their wishes, desires, and maintenance of their specific tribal aesthetic design systems and symbols. Bringing American Indian graphic representation into the 21st century with a no-holds-barred, unapologetic philosophy, Ryan aims to disassemble the public's perception of Indigenous peoples. He currently lives and runs his company, Red Hand Media, among his people of the traditional Osage community in Pahaska, Oklahoma. I think we should just give a round of applause for him. Thank you for joining us tonight. My name is Sarah Scout. I'm here with Sonia Edworthy, Ridwan Islam, and Alana Dawn. So much for having us. Um, I'm happy to introduce Sarah with a little bit of a longer bio. Um, Sarah Scout is an active urban Aboriginal writer and Indigenous activist in Calgary, Alberta, community where she has lived for the past 10 years. From 2000 to 2002, she attended Lethbridge Community College where she studied print journalism and communication arts under Darcy Cavanaugh. 
Her work has been published in print mediums such as The Endeavor, The Lethbridge Herald, Say, and Beetroot Magazine. From November 2006 to February 2009, she was the managing editor of New, Tri New Tribe Magazine, Calgary's nonprofit Urban Aboriginal Youth Monthly. Founding the Aboriginal Writers Circle in 2007, Sarah created this group for Aboriginal writers, authors, and storytellers to come together in celebration and exploration of the written word and oral storytelling tradition. In her spare time, she also creates and distributes her own independent zines, which document personal anecdote, stories, life, writing experience, and poetry in a mixed collage of black and white po uh, photography and experimental graphic design. Her zine titles include Outcast by Choice, uh, Outcast by Choice Issue 2, A Choice of Futures Waiting to Happen, Jack Rubber, Assimilated Ego, Assimilated Ego 2, and Indian Graveyard. Winner of the Royal Bank of, Canadian, er, of Canada Aboriginal Student Two-Year Scholarship in 2009, Sarah studied at the University of Calgary in pursuit of a BA in English. She currently works full-time as the founder of Decolonize Calgary and is writing her first uh, life writing novel, Incomplete Indian, The Indigenous Life Writings of Sarah Scout. Um, so yeah, I'm really happy to be able to read this because um, on Saturday we had an amazing workshop that was about decolonize through anti-oppression and um, I forgot to read the bio. So it was, it's nice to have this context when talking about these people doing stuff. <laughs> yeah. occupies the land of the Blackfoot Confederacy. Um, I myself am Blackfoot. Gana. Um, I don't speak my language, my language fluently, but I'm learning. And to pay respects to my ancestors, um, this land and all of you here, I will um, open with Night we were talking about this uh, event, and we like to call it uh, Decolonize Together because we recognize that decolonizing has several steps. One is uh, construct deconstructing, and then decolonizing. But deco to, to decolonize is a very personal, is a very personal uh, topic because it relies on our cognition of the world around us, how we uh, perceive our politics and social structures. So decolonizing together simply means that the colonized and the colonizer have to both de both decolonize together. And it is such a very personal thing that we wanted to open this uh, up to discussion. And uh, yeah, so. Okay, uh, I'm Elena Dawn, and um, so as Rudra was saying, decolonizing can be a very, it is very personal because it, the process, at least for me, was I had to actually really confront myself and deconstruct myself. Because um, while I instinctively and like just intuitively knew decolonize is a really important process, I found it challenging within myself to actually define it. So thanks, Sarah, for inviting me, because before today, 
Um, it really sunk in how Sarah said that only one, only you can define what decolonize is for yourself. Um, so I'm just going to read uh, what I, kind of what, how I define decolonize because I'm still learning um, about it. Um, so decolonizing is transformational growth, consciousness, healing, a continuous process, confronting the oppressor and oppressed that is in with each of us. It confronts oppression of human beings and the earth. It's a process necessary for unity, solidarity, and I believe humanity's evolution. Uh, it's an act, act of daily decision in the language we use, how we approach conflict, build relationships, and create systemic change. And I believe this is the responsibility of all of us to deconstruct ourselves and decolonize together. Um, and I think this is a really important um, process to engage in um, as activists and in particular it was Occupy Movement. It's not something that we can just gloss over. Um, so yeah, that's my thoughts. Yeah, I'm just going to read a short thing from the scene that I wrote um, that I actually was writing for a while but then um, published or printed last um, December at around the time that the Occupy camp was um, being kicked out of the plaza. Um, so stories in the scene kind of are not about that, but there's some things that come into it. And this one is about my grandpa, which, okay, so for me, decolonizes decolonizing myself and thinking about decolonizing our society um, is kind of, uh, omnipresent, it's like um, part of experience in everyday life and also um, examining and thinking about things more. So my family and thinking about where I'm from and what's that about is part of that for me. So, um, okay, my papa also tells of his memories as a child growing up in Troshu, Delia and Lacombe. His vague re recollections of, and this is his, a direct quote from him, and he, he passed away this year, but he was 93. So he was born in 1918 um, in Lacombe. Um, so his recollections of the native Indians who roamed the area with their horses and wagons, camping on the area, camping on the prairie, moving from here to there. Um, he says he realizes how unjust and how horrible the perception was of them and how rough it was for them now. He realizes that, but he was a kid then, and he was told never to talk to Indians because they're stupid and can't talk anyway. He says he remembers being told those things and believing them because he didn't know any different. He says the white people thought they were so superior, and he says he doesn't know why, they just did. It upsets him to think of how unfair it was and how as a kid in the 20s and 30s, he didn't have a choice about it. And I asked myself, how much has changed since then? Um, and so, I mean, that's a short thing that is really intense to me, like listening to him say that is really intense. Um, so just learning about what it was like not that long ago, less than a hundred years ago, um, and learning about the treaty that was signed, um, Treaty 7, in the, seven, in the 1870s um, is really important, I think, to grounding myself in like what this all means and my relationship to it. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> Decolonize Calgary came about during uh, the Occupy Camp battle in the plaza. Um, I feel myself, uh, for me, decolonize is a consciousness or an awakening. Um, to my own identity and really looking into my own mirror, finding out who I am and what my place is in this world, in this society, in this city. Um, I, I'm a writer. Um, a lot of people said my writing is kind of existentialists, you know, they read my scenes and they're like, you know, some, some people really enjoy them and some people 
uh, really hate them. <laughs> and um, I often tell people, you know, after reading my stuff, um, not to get too caught up in what's right or what's wrong, what's black, what's, what's right. Um, because for me, it's just me trying to find my way in the world. These are just my thoughts, and thoughts change. But it's me just on my own decolonizing journey. I didn't, uh, originally, I wasn't going to write a proposal to occupy, you know, with any ideas to change society, even though we were so riled up and everyone was, you know, putting in their proposals and organizing. I uh, ended up at Occupy because I was invited. Um, I was invited by some university students who, um, up until that point, hadn't really talked to me at school. And um, I went down and I wanted to check it out. But I remember when I actually made it down there and seeing those tents, um, the way they were positioned, and the feeling that I got at ground zero, so to speak, uh, reminded me so much of um, the Sundance and Indian days, and just these memories I have growing up on the reserve. And the fact that it was in the middle of the city was um, actually really exciting. And uh, I found myself going back every day, you know, donating, doing what I could. Um, and then it was Alana, I met Alana, and she reached out to me. Um, she reached out to me online and said she wanted to learn more about indigenous issues here at a local level. And so we started collaborating back and forth. And I just thought how special that was, you know, to make a friend. Um, a Caucasian woman who, without that camp um, and the universe bringing us together, we probably never would have talked. You know, our paths never would have crossed. And um, since then, uh, things for me have gotten really intense and strange. Um, for those of you who don't know, I'm currently being criminalized by the Calgary Police Service. Um, and I don't really know why. But in, one, in the report, and hopefully when it comes out, um, in the report it says I was speaking an unknown language. Unknown to who? Because uh, one of the things that I am learning, and it was actually pointed out to me by Professor Anthony Hall, is that English is a foreign language. And I speak English rather well. Something I, I learned, um, and I like to quote her, her name's Jennifer Kelly, she's a professor at the University of Calgary. She says that First Nations history is Canadian history. To add to that, I thought, to not know First Nations history is to not know who you are as a Canadian, if that is how you choose to identify. We often think about um, colonized countries. We think about Africa, we think about the Middle East, think about South Asia. But we often don't, we fail to realize that we live in an illegal colony. <clears throat> so part of my research has been into the illegal colonies, United States, Canada, and how they've transformed from 
neo-feudalist to fascist uh, government. Um, <clears throat> so for us to understand, first of all, where we live and uh, how we live, that's kind of a step in our deconstructing and how we can fi finally see for ourselves and make our cr critical thoughts on what it is that we, you know, what we're living in, what uh, rules and law are we, obeying, are we obeying here. I like to call the law that we follow here very, a colorable law. It's a law that's only given force by our impelled servitude, by our impelled performance and, do, and following it. That's the only thing that gives it its color. Um, so for me, decolonize is actually removing the barriers that divide, that divide our community, that divide our society. A lot of these, uh, from the previous workshop, we've discovered that one of the largest and most pervasive uh, barriers and dividers of society is classism. <laughs> classism, basically what you inherited from your family or, you know, whether you're a have or a have not, it affects the way that society treats you, it affects the way that you interact with people, the friends and, and bonds that you make, and the relationships that you pursue. So for me, decolonizing is to get rid of these, to these barriers such that we can all have a more egalitarian society. And uh, I incorporate social dominance theory a lot in my research. And from that, it, it always turns out, all throughout history, it's always been two types of people, those who try to enhance hierarchy in our society and those who try to attenuate it. I've always tried to be the hierarchy attenuating social agent, but that's all I'll all, 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 all us to do. Um, so yeah, while I was doing my research, I came across some YouTube videos around uh, a woman who's speaking on the indigenous perspective of the Occupy movement, um, and some of her words that really impacted me were, because um, it reminded me back when we were at El Book Plaza and a lot of us were wanting to build more relationships and solidarity with First Nations people. Uh, we didn't understand why they weren't out there occupying with us and, oh, let's just ask them to, um, ask some people to help us set up a teepee and then that's gonna help us bring solidarity. And uh, so what she spoke to in this video was really like impactful and empowering, or not empowering, but powerful because she pointed out that indigenous people have been resisting um, the same like uh, forces that we're trying to fight for 400 years or more. Um, and the one quote was that the will to live sometimes is an act of resistance for indigenous people. Um, so that really sat with me and just made me really think about um, how just as people who can probably consider ourselves educated as activists and progressive, non-racist, you know, tending anti oppression, it's we don't know what that's like. And I think that's why approaching conflict um, in a decolonizing approach really creates that safe space so we can learn um, how we impact the other person even if though we're not intentionally oppressing them. Um, How many people have read or looked at uh, the treaties signed by First Nations in this area? Yeah. Okay, some people. Yeah. Um, they're really strange documents, the treaties. Um, and one thing that is really important about, I guess, history of, of these agreements is that um, it's not clear whether they were actually signed by um, by leaders, by First Nations leaders, or whether they were um, uh, forged X's that were to indicate a signature. So the agreements are very ephemeral and dictate so much of the law and what has happened since. So I just want to read part of the Treaty 7. Is that okay? Um, so Treaty 7 was a peace treaty made between two nations, the tribes of the Blackfoot Con Confederacy, including Siksika, Pikani, which is Pagan, known as Pagan sometimes, and Kainawa, blood. 
the Tsutina and the Stony or Bears Pod Chiniki and Wesley Goodstony. Um, all of these names are Englishized and um, depending on who you talk to, aren't accurate. Um, her mo so between this um, nation, the Blackfoot Confederacy, and Her Most Gracious Majesty, the Queen of Great Britain. When Treaty 7 was made in 1877, it became the last in a series of agreements concluded between the Government of Canada and the Indians of the Northwest Territories during the decade of the 1870s. From the government's perspective, the need for Treaty 7 was immediate and simple. As part of the terms of bringing British Columbia into Confederation in 1871, the Canadian governments had promised to build a transcontinental railway within 10 years. Such a line would have to traverse the newly acquired land, still nominally in control of Indian tribes. Huge land concessions would need to be offered to the company building the railway and later, uh, and later, the existence of the line would encourage large-scale immigration to the Western Prairies. When the British North America Act was passed in 1867, the responsibility for the Indian lands had been vested in the federal government. Further, the government was bound by the terms of the Royal Proclamation of 1763, which recognized Indians as rightful occupiers of their hunting grounds until such a time as these were ceded to the government authority. This meant that the railway could not be built until the rights of the Indians along its route had been settled. Therefore, during the period from 1871 to 1876, the government of Canada had systematically concluded treaties with all the tribes in the arable regions of the Northwest Territories, with the exception of those inhabiting some 50,000 square miles of land south of the Red Deer River and adjacent to the Rocky Mountains. These lands were occupied by Treaty 7 First Nations. Well, they weren't called that then. The articles of Treaty 7 outlined the areas where the present day reserves now exist. The making of Treaty 7 occurred at Blackfoot Crossing, which is located on the Siksika Reserve east of Calgary. So that's not the treaties, that's just the context, because I think you should just go and look, up, look them up online and read the, the actual text of the treaties. They're very long. And During uh, one of our discussions, we were talking about the barriers of, of division. Um, they include, so far what we've come up with is the other, oppression, social dominance theory, exclusion, not listening and hearing one another, classism, stereotypes, false and manipulated Canadian history, rigid societal constructs of the norm and acceptable, Anglo-conformity multiculturalism, white and assimilated guilt, censorship, colonist law, uh, colonialist law, sorry, institutional racism and discrimination, corporate media, unethical and corrupt institutionalism, continued complacent genocide, etc. Some of the tools of unity we discussed were awakening and awareness, effort and no effort. Um, do you want to speak to uh, something Rid had, well, Rid had said, um, it takes no effort to decolonize. Do you want to expand on that? I meant to say it takes, it takes no effort to colonize. Yeah, but it takes a lot of effort to decolonize. Because the colonizer culture is so pervasive through our uh, corporate media, to our corporate television, corporate police service, corporate everything is everything is a corporation. Alberta is a corporation. Calgary is a corporation. So when you look at the constructs that that we live in, it, it has like an oppressive colonial um, flair that's been reverberating throughout our history. To and part of a. To, Part of decolonizing is to is to see that everyone is a human being, because what happened was in Canada we were able to marginalize the Aboriginal people by stripping them of the human status, just like anywhere else in the world. You can only start so, like uh, oppressing people once you've got rid of that pesky thing, human rights, out of the way. Um, so to decolonize certainly does take a lot more effort. 
because it it, um, it makes you have to think critically. You have to think critically, you have to start examining things for yourself with an open mind. And also, it, you have to basically reject the colonizer history, the history that was forged on our history books, and uh, all, the, all the people that were written out of it. Um, that was pretty much to explain. Um, we also discussed um, guilt, you know, white guilt or um, assimilated guilt. And um, because Alana had mentioned, you know, even the word decolonize um, provokes an emotional response in a lot of people. Um, you know, I always say, them fighting words, you know? And I'm like, do you know why you're fighting? <laughs> um, for me, uh, I see myself as an assimilated Aboriginal First Nations woman. Um, I grew up, I'm a city Indian. I grew up on and off reserve, but mostly I grew up in the city. And yes, I do have the privilege of education. I was able to go to college and university. You know, I, I love reading. Like I, I love reading, writing. Um, but at the same time, uh, my own father, um, has lived on the streets for most of my life, um, extremely addicted to alcohol and drugs. My sister, um, who grew up in foster care with me, um, and a, in a lot of native homes where we were abused every which way, when she turned 18, she, um, some guy gave her liquid acid it fried her brain, and she was never the same after that. Um, so, my own guilt um, is, you know, um, sometimes I used to think it should have been me, but it's not. And that's something I, I on my personal journey that I'm coming to terms with. Um, and that I do have the privilege of a sane mind, which is sane, quote unquote, sane uh, mind. Overrated. <laughs> Agreed. Agreed. Um, and education. But I also made the choice, I remember being on the reserve as a little kid, and I made the choice um, to not drink, do drugs, or smoke. And Amazingly, that followed through, and I'm 31 now, and um, those, anyway, those were some of the choices that, that led me on the path yeah, that I am here today. my commitment to this presentation as Wobblinies, <laughs> which is very true because and this goes to the part of uh, deconstructing myself because I felt as a white female somehow, no matter my opinion, it was going to be offensive and so I was nervous about even sharing it. Um, but that's part of oppressing myself and I realized if I do that then I'm never going to decolonize together and learn. Um, so and there was something else I was going to say and I forgot. It'll come back to me. Um, yeah, I, I, I want to have more of these conversations with more people. Um, I think there is a lot of shame around talking about um, privilege and oppression and our different roles and experiences within that. It's hard to talk about um, I mean, sometimes it's not even about talking, it's about um, just being judged and just feeling like shit or just feeling really scared or different, you know, like situations bring up different things. And I think talking about stuff and researching, like we've been talking about, um, is a way that I can start. And so I hope that we have more opportunities to talk about things with everyone. wrap up uh, unless, oh, 
we'll, let's wrap up and then we can just close. Um, I do want to add, um, again, back to the tools of unity. So awakening and awareness, effort and no effort, conversation, friendship, listening and learning. Um, and to bring up uh, that quote from the Mohawk woman um, Alana had mentioned, 400 years of resistance, rejecting the language of colonialism, conquest, and exploitation. Uh, a focus on commonalities instead of differences. Closing the gap, respect, anti-oppression, freedom of assembly, association, and speech, decolonizing ourselves um, by ourselves, but also together um, to further that deconstruction. Thank you. Yeah, I think, thanks for everyone.